Once upon a time, two filmmakers were each given the same script and had the opportunity to direct their very first feature using this same source material. One of these filmmakers was Shane Dawson, who adapted it into 2014's Not Cool, which was fun like a bowel obstruction. The other filmmaker was Anna Martimucci, who adapted it into Holidaysburg, a different movie that was watchable. I've covered Shane's film and his part in this reality series, The Chair, that conducted this experiment, but we haven't dived into Anna's work yet. I'm not saying that either of these people made a perfect movie. No, not at all. But to watch them side by side is such a fascinating experiment. So grab a snack and settle in because we're saddling up for another round of cool, cool commentary. <laughs> Hello television viewers, my name is Nick. Thank you so much for joining me once again on my channel. Please don't click away just because I did that with my arms. It's time for another clip breakdown. This is the playlist where I give my commentary and analysis on movies that I love and love to not love, whatever the case is. Before we dive into Holidaysburg, make sure you give this video a big thumbs up if you wanna see even more clip breakdowns from your favorite movies. I really need suggestions, so drop those in the comments immediately. But most importantly, if you're new to my channel or if you've been watching, I would love to have you click that subscribe button right down here. That way you never miss new videos from me. I'm uploading fresh stuff twice a week, baby. So turn on notifications and you'll never be left in the dark. What? I'm so proud of my last two videos covering The Chair and Shane Dawson's Not Cool. Easily two of my biggest videos on this channel, so thank you all so much for the support. Am I a little embarrassed that one of my biggest videos had this ugly glitch in the middle of it? No, I feel great about that. Ooh. But a lot of people have been asking me to do more commentary and I just wanna give you a friendly reminder that I have a whole playlist, baby, where I break down lots of your favorite TV shows or TV movies you've never heard of. So you can binge those while I work on new stuff, but you gotta let me know what I have to watch next. I love doing these types of videos. To a certain extent, Holidaysburg starts out the same way Not Cool did. Both scripts include a breakup that occurs during an intimate encounter. I cannot say without getting demonetized, I'm pretty sure. I'm not gonna risk it. I can see why the screenwriter named Dan Schofer chose this as a plot device. I think it's a really interesting way to start off a movie because normally that's not when somebody gets broken up with. You know, you think it's a romantic scene at the beginning and then it turns into a big conflict. By the way, actually in the show, The Chair, Anna Martimucci went by just that name, but now her IMDb, she goes by A.M. Lucas. So I'm just gonna call her A.M. from now on. Another interesting fact is both Holidaysburg and Not Cool had to have the same main characters. Both films star two female leads named Tori and Heather and a main male lead named Scott. In The Chair, the TV show, they did this so that viewers like us could watch both films and see, oh, I see how they adapted it for that and they adapted it for that. So I did appreciate that. It was very convenient to draw the parallels between these movies, but even just the settings and the situations, like a lot of it is almost shot for shot looking identical, but just like the most sudden, abrupt, weird changes on the part of Shane Dawson. Whereas on Anna Martimucci's side, she made changes to the original script, but moreover, just like rewriting all of the dialogue. So right off the bat with the first scene of Holidaysburg, I get a feel for this character, Heather. This is that scene where Heather breaks up with Scott. I think about dying a lot. I think we should break up. What? That's a snappy, cool beginning or like kind of button right before you go to the title card because I understood just from that little clip that Heather is depressed. Heather is played by Claire Cipelli and Scott there is played by Tobin Mitnick. And right off the bat, Scott's performance lets me know that he's really shocked by this and it totally caught him off guard and it sets the tone for the rest of the movie. For comparison, here's a little bit of how Shane Dawson handled this plot point. I'm sorry, Scott. It's over. Yeah, it was through a glory hole. Subtle is not his middle name. I think his middle name is just, oh. In fact, that character in Not Cool, named Heather, was a total cartoon of a person. She was not based in reality at all. In Holidaysburg, Heather is a really interesting character. She's fully realized. I'm like rooting for her the whole time. Claire is really good at playing a depressed character in a realistic way. And I definitely get that she's like home for her first break after college and she doesn't like it. She's not happy there. She's going through depression. After titles, we go 
go right to our other main character, Tori, played by Rachel Keller, and she's on the bus back to Holidaysburg. I love that we see her on this bus because we instantly start to get a sense of the landscape of this part of Pennsylvania. You can't see it, but I'm still knocking this aloe plant over all the time. Holidaysburg absolutely makes Pittsburgh a part of the movie. It makes Pennsylvania a character in the film because they just pay reverence to it with the cinematography, with the establishing shots, and with the way the characters talk about it. Not Cool by Shane Dawson could have literally taken place anywhere. They just happened to shoot it in Pittsburgh, and maybe once or twice the characters say something about Pittsburgh, but ultimately the location has nothing to do with Scott's movie. So Tori is giving us this monologue in voiceover, and it's very helpful because she's giving us her backstory while we're getting a lay of the land. We're literally becoming immersed in the story. At no point did I become immersed in Shane Dawson's movie. I became anti-immersed. I was floating on top of it like oil. Okay, let's see if we can learn a little bit about our main girl, Tori, here. In second grade, I helped a Teletubby and was sent home from school. I didn't know what I was doing, but I knew to be embarrassed. And since then, I've never really stopped being embarrassed. Love it. That's just a short little clip, but I'm instantly like, okay, she was a little weird in uh, elementary school, but she was ashamed of it and was always ashamed of herself after that. That sets her up pretty good for me. In Shane Dawson's Not Cool, this is how Tori introduces herself using the same style of voiceover to kind of give us the context. I did have sex with a zucchini once, so I guess that was kind of silly. What? Like, why? The How did they go from humping a Teletubby to using a zucchini uh, like that? It feels like the screenwriter was basically asked to just take every joke and crank it up to 11. Like, slime time live, baby. You want it to be the loudest, most colorful version of itself. I don't like it. I don't like it. When I was first watching this movie, even having seen that this was an issue from the development of the script, I forgot that Tori is a different character from Heather. So the girl you see breaking up with her boyfriend is not the same as the person you see on the bus. These two actresses look so similar. It's really hard to tell them apart at the beginning. And Anna had to take, or AM, had to take a lot of care to correct this after her test audience was like, I thought those were the same characters until like 20 minutes in. So the way she handled it with editing definitely helped. I'll, I'll show you that in a second. But regardless, Tori's voiceover continues to give us some more details about what's going on. That's what's so awesome about college. All these new people, they don't know that I didn't get like any boobs at all until junior year. I think that's a great line because she's saying, oh, nobody at college knows that I was awkward as a kid. All people can relate to puberty, you know, like it was an awkward time. And she's saying that college, she was freed from all of that. Tell me then why in Not Cool by Shane Dawson, they tried to get the same point across, but said it this way. Get to go to college where no one knows you broke your own hymen with a baby carrot. Queen of relatability. Everybody knows how that is. Like, I'm not saying everything a character does has to be relatable, but if you want me to understand who she is right off the bat, you better try relating to me. Because when I saw this, it was like, was she a nerd in high school? Or was she like promiscuous? Like she wanted to rub herself on everything, it sounds like. It goes from humping a Teletubby and being ashamed of it to wanting to have sex with vegetables. Vegetables. The hardest word to say when you're gay, because you sound so gay when you say vegetables. What do you want for lunch? Vegetables. Okay. Broke your hymen with the baby carrot? Like, shut up. Also, in Shane's film, they did not use this voiceover at the beginning to introduce us to the other two characters, Scott and Heather. I think it's really clever that AM did this in Holidaysburg. They don't know if you were Scott Karaszewski, the coolest guy in my high school because his brother had been, or if you were Heather Zarelli, the hot girl who everyone wanted. You know, I don't think voiceover or narration is like the strongest way. It's kind of expositional, right? You're basically telling me what's up instead of showing me, but at least they used it to good effect in this. I think the story is more easily understood with the voiceover. And I get to meet these two characters. I realize Scott used to be popular because his older brother was, and then Heather was the popular girl everyone wanted. Good, I'm already starting to understand who they are. I did not get that from Scott or Heather ever throughout the whole runtime of Not Cool. So I appreciated knowing that off the bat when watching Holidaysburg. When I was watching Not Cool, one of my main issues was like, who is Scott? He comes in like this timid guy, but apparently he's the heart 
heartthrob who everyone loves. It was very confusing, very jarring. I did not like to be jarred. Unfortunately, when she was casting the movie... Are you gonna change their looks a little bit? I mean, when the three of them are right there like that, they look kind of similar. Yeah, I thought the same thing, on as soon as I saw the pictures, but it's different. Like, let's see... They don't actually yeah, look similar at all. Heather was meant to be an Asian character in the script, and in this one, she still has an Asian mother, but she clearly presents as white. Maybe she's supposed to be part Asian. So for me, it was a mistake for AM to cast someone who is just a white brunette opposite another girl who's a white brunette. If they had drastically different appearances, it would not be an issue. So she did kind of pay for that decision. You can see in this next clip how they tried to address it in post. Obviously you can't reshoot the movie. I wasn't cool in high school and I definitely wasn't considered hot. I Getting another go at things is awesome. Until of course you come home for Thanksgiving break. You can see how they did that split screen paneling to show that we have Tori, we have Scott, we have Heather. I think it really helped us realize, okay, the girl with the curly hair is different as she's the one talking and the girl who broke up with her boyfriend is the depressed one who's laying on the floor. Even knowing all of that when I was watching it, my brain had to catch up to the movie once that split screen happened. I realized, oh, different character, got it. I love this little clippy montage they give of Pittsburgh or Holidaysburg, I guess, because it's like churches, shopping malls, lawn mats, house, 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 house. It really gives you the sense that this is a mundane suburban community where not a lot goes on and she's coming back from a big city. I think that's really well established. We don't get any of that in Shane's movie and it's sorely missed. I'm sorry that I keep, actually I'm not sorry I keep comparing them. That's literally the point of this video. Why am I sorry? You be sorry for not expecting that. By the way, my review of Shane Dawson's movie, there was a few comments that were like, this was in 2014, leave it in the past. I'm like, eh whatever. And then someone left a link. Well, then you must also hate these movies. And it listed a bunch of other problematic movies like Revenge of the Nerds, Love Actually. I'm like, yeah, I do hate those movies. Those movies are also problematic, especially if it's not aware that it's problematic. Like it's just purveying negative stereotypes. I think that as long as that movie is, exists, I'm allowed to comment on it. Also, I love that just even as Tori is pulling up to her bus station, we see this friend who's greeting her. And I'm like, I don't know anything about this character, but I already know about about this character, you know what I'm saying? Upon the first sight. That in filmmaking is what we call show, don't tell. That's when you're giving information to the audience without them realizing it. Otherwise, I'm aware I'm watching a movie. Scott's in his house, which is all packed up to his surprise. He's talking to his mom who is like, well, we told you we're moving. And he's like, well, I didn't think it was that serious. Which to me, I'm like, what? Okay. Apparently he hasn't spoken to anybody from home in like three weeks He's at UCLA. So the mom is basically like, how did you even get a ticket home? We didn't expect you. It's crazy that you came unexpected, but whatever, hang out with your older brother. The older brother's character's name is Phil. In real life, the brother-in-law of the director, Anna, or AM. So it was really interesting to watch behind the scenes because he was helping her as a director throughout most of this process. And then she had to direct him in this, in all of his scenes and it it created some tension at certain points. So for all of the good that this movie had, AM definitely had some weak points. She used her fiance, she used her brother-in-law, all as like key roles in her crew. And I'm not saying that's a bad thing. It kind of had this like Coppola family thing where all of Sofia Coppola hires, you know, her father and her brothers for different things all the time. So it's not unheard of, but in a way I was kind of like, are you trying to be the Coppolas? And in certain cases, it's like, she was a little blind to the fact that her brother-in-law or her fiance were making decisions for her. It was a little hard to see her, you know, feel subservient to some of the men on set. But she's a first time director and I have no idea what it's like to navigate being a female director or a female anything. So I can't imagine what kind of pressure she's under to appear willing to take that advice or willing to be a team player. Heather tells her mom that she's thinking of dropping out of school and Heather's mom is basically like, good luck with that, your dad will never let you. Tori is getting a ride home from the bus station from her best friend, Katie, who's the redhead woman we saw at the train station. This conversation is very familiar to me. It's like Katie lives in Holidaysburg, so she's talking about, oh, all of the parties that are gonna be happening, who's gonna be there. And Tori's like, I don't even know these people. They were younger than us in high school. Katie is definitely that girl, you know what I'm saying? The actress who plays her is named Kate Boyer, and she's an accomplished stunt performer now. A lot of the talent, I mean, I think basically all of the main cast of this movie have gone on to do bigger mainstream productions. So I'm very happy for all of them. One thing I completely was missing from Not Cool 
was the idea that Scott was super popular in high school and everyone loved him in high school and he wishes he was back in high school. That did not come through in Shane's performance or version of the script at all. Ooh. So I was delighted when AM gave it to us right at the very beginning of the film, right when we meet Phil, who was played by the director's brother-in-law. He comes in and meets with Scott, who's there bummed that everything's packed up and that he didn't know. But it moves right into this area where Scott starts uh, talking about his senior portrait and in a way where I instantly know who he is and instantly get this part of his character. You notice the nuance here. I could have gone full wig, but I said no. Terry Fong of Terry Fong Studio Photography is on to me. You know I've heard the story before. Quiet. With the simple utilization of mom's maternity sweater, I was able to achieve an effect far much more impactful, nay, profound, than any simple wig. Should I go run upstairs and uh, grab mine? Junior year. When I slick my hair back. So the brothers are talking about their funny senior pictures and you can tell from the interaction that Scott's told the story a hundred times and it's so performative and rehearsed. So right away when I watched this, I was like, oh, I get it. He's one of those guys who like misses high school and like still tells stories about high school. I had a boyfriend like that once where he was like, this hilarious thing happened in drama club. And then Melissa came and said to me and I would be like, what? How are you still remembering what Melissa said in 2003? <laughs> this is years ago. Not only do I not remember any stories from high school, I mean a few, but the things that I thought were funny back then, I don't really still think are not funny. I don't know. The things I thought about myself that were cool back in high school, I no longer find cool. I'm like, tacky. You're tacky and I hate you. I will note, however, that this senior picture is not reading as particularly funny to me. It looks like him with glasses. So the wig thing, I didn't know what he was talking about. The sweater doesn't look like that crazy because you can, you can basically see none of it. And also some grammar here. He says, far much more impactful. Far much more impactful. Nay, profound. Far much more impactful is not proper grammar, but outside of that, it just felt like he wasn't confident in that line. I'm such an acting coach sometimes. But we also get a feel for Phil here. He's sort of a deadbeat. He deals weed. So both of them are familiar characters. And the way Phil reacts, he's like, should I go get my senior portrait? It reminded me like, oh, they were both really popular in high school and both kind of stuck in this glory days reliving moment. I liked it. I like the character development. In both versions of this movie, Tori's character comes home and her sister is getting engaged. In Not Cool, you might remember that the sister is played by Lisa Schwartz, which was Shane's girlfriend at the time time. And in this movie, Tori's sister is named Courtney, played by Dana Griffith. And this is where things get a little funny for me again with the decisions that Shane made. So basically in the original version of the script and in the version that AM went with, Angela is a lesbian. So she's getting married to a woman. The engagement party is for a same-sex marriage. For some reason, Shane decided, oh, okay, yeah, I'll take that lesbian sister and make it a blind sister. And right when I first heard that, I was like, ugh. What? Because I feel like in his mind, he was like, oh, I'm going to make it even crazier. Like, no, it's, what's crazier than a gay sister than a blind sister? And for me, it's like, I don't think that the gay sister thing was supposed to be crazy at all. I don't think that was supposed to be funny. I think it was just supposed to be like a realistic piece of the story that gave it a little bit of grit, something interesting. So regardless, I do want to point out that AM was not immune to casting herself in her own film. She cast herself as Courtney, the sister's fiance. In Shane's movie, the fiance was Gil. He had like puffy hair and was weird. It was really hard to get behind Shane playing not one, not two, but three characters and not cool because he couldn't even really direct well. So why are you trying to star in every scene? But I can definitely support AM in putting herself in this supporting role, which was actually really funny. I, I She might have played one of my favorite characters in the movie. I don't know if that's just because I saw so much of AM throughout the TV show that she was in. Here's the scene where... Kate, who just drove our girl Tori home, meets all of the family. Courtney has a vocal cord injury, so she has to speak really softly right now. Hi, how are you? Really nice to meet you. Really nice to meet you. Hey. I crack up every time at that. <laughs> I just think it's so funny that Courtney has a vocal cord injury, so she has to say everything like this, and she's like, hi, how are you? I just feel like, okay, it gives her, it gives the story a little bit of texture in this like comedic moment where Katie totally mocks her. I love that. Even Courtney's reaction is hilarious, where she's like, oh, you're playing it that way? Okay. Another aspect that I really appreciate from Holidaysburg that I didn't get from Not Cool is how well they build out these sibling relationships. I have two older sisters myself, so I really appreciate 
appreciate seeing sibling dynamics played out realistically on screen. And it's a big part of going home. You know, your siblings are all up in your business all of a sudden. Here we see just a moment between Scott and Phil that feels real for two brothers. I'm packing everything in a U-Haul and driving it down on Sunday. I have to be out by the 30th. Which means you have to pack your room by then. No more house, Mushi. Nothing. No more house, Mishi. See, like, they have their cute little nicknames for each other, and I was like, oh, they must have been saying that since they were little boys. So it felt real, it felt natural, and it felt heavy, you know? Like, Scott really seems super disturbed about having to move, his parents are moving to Florida. I forget if I mentioned that, but his mom took a job in Florida. We don't have the same situation in Not Cool. They kind of altered this a little bit. Scott's dad isn't getting rid of the house, but he's getting rid of the vinyl vault, which is the record store that he owns. And this is how Scott finds out about that in this movie. What the hell, Dad? You're closing the store? What? He finds out from his sister. Scott in Holidaysburg coming in and discovering the whole house packed up and being like, what? That's an active protagonist, where as with Scott in Not Cool, completely passive. He's learning about all of these conflicts secondhand. He basically had nothing to do with it. And it's just not as exciting as watching an active protagonist who is doing things of his own volition and not just having them done to him, which was really Scott, the whole movie, things were being done to him. Tori gave him the list of what they would be doing. Heather pushes him on the bed like he's literally having things physically done to him, but also everything just seems to be happening around him and he's along for the ride. Another similarity that I really enjoyed a lot more in Holidaysburg was that it's all centered around Thanksgiving weekend. So it starts on Wednesday and ends on Sunday. I'm just realizing that's why there's so many party scenes in both of these movies, because there's four nights of parties and they're all at different people's houses, but sometimes not. Uh. I guess that's just comes with the territory of writing something across the span of four days, but you do start to be like, wait, where are we again? What night is this? So maybe I would have done something like a calendar tearing away to be like, it's now the Wednesday. Cause it was a little hard to follow exactly what day we were on. It's just like all the same weekend, I know that. But in either case, both movies feature the family having the sister's engagement party. That happened in Not Cool. And here's how we're finding out about it. Who's even coming to this thing on Saturday? It's all their friends. We said, why don't we just get some pizza and some beers but no she wants to make deviled eggs see i love courtney and angela they're just so likable and so real i love the actress who plays angela as well dana was it yep i'm getting good at these names hun who's hun did i just call someone hun Oh, I'm sorry to this man. It's also like it makes sense that when Tori comes home, she already knows that her sister is getting married. You know, it's not like some big surprise. That would be more realistic because you obviously are in touch with your older sister even when you're at college. In Shane's movie, this is how Tori finds out that her sister is getting engaged. Gil and I are getting It's just like a more basic storytelling thing to be like, hello sister, here's some news. It's like you don't trust your audience enough to understand from context that like, oh, this is the in-law. And I even feel like Tori in Holidaysburg has a separate relationship with the sister-in-law, Courtney. Like they seem to really like each other. Also, side rant, Shane, don't remove the only same sex representation in your film that's not disgusting. He took out the real lesbian couple and added in a bunch of gay jokes. It sounds kind of gay. Not gonna be winning a GLAAD award anytime soon. Anyway, Tori gets a text from Kate and she's like, all right, I'm gonna go to this party that she was telling me about in the car. Meanwhile, we see Scott over at his friend's house. Scott's friend's name is Will Petrov. At first, they just call him Petrov throughout the movie. So I was like, oh, is he like really Russian? <laughs> but his name's Will Petrov. Since Scott doesn't have a sister who has their own separate love story going on, like we had in Not Cool, I think that Petrov sort of subs in for Joel in Not Cool. There's really no direct course relation there because the brother in this movie has a different subplot of his own that we'll get to. Am I like so shiny? No, it's fine. So Petrov is like the kid that Scott was best friends with in high school. Petrov never moved to college. He's living in his mom's basement and never moved out. So he's kind of like what Scott didn't do. I love this scene because A, it's pretty funny in like this kind of understated way, but also it gives us some more idea of Scott being full of himself, which was spoken to us in not cool. They were like, I'm full of myself all the time when Shane is fake crying. I'm selfish 
I'm self-absorbed. If you're gonna fake cry, you need to have liquid on your face. That's sad, okay? Like, I'm really sad. If you don't have liquid on your face, you look like a phony. And if you're a phony, you get a boo. A boo to your fake tears. That's how you can tell my brain is getting too hot. What am I talking about? As soon as I start to sweat, I'm like, do a joke where I can splash myself with water. I just ripped this plant. Oh my God. I need to just not have plants on the table, around me, or whatever. So here's the scene that tells us a little bit more about how full of himself that Scott is. I'm sure everybody's just holding their breath, waiting on you to show up. People are gonna expect me to make an appearance, show my face. Scott is so annoying in this. He's like, people are gonna expect me to show up at this party. It's like, no one cares, bro. You went to UCLA for three months, you think anyone misses you? There's a quick scene here where Tori sees Heather in the grocery store. This is the first time where the test audience was understanding that these were two separate characters. So they went a large portion of this movie not even knowing that Heather and Tori were two different people. So I can see why they really had to try to fix that. So we go to this party on the Wednesday before Thanksgiving. Here we get a little bit more from the best friend Katie, who I just love that there are examples of actual jokes that I found funny in here. Here's some from her. She's clearly depressed. Yeah, but it's like, I'm depressed too and I actually have a reason. My roommate barely speaks English. I thought she was born here. Yeah, but she like talks Indian on the phone all the time with her parents. <laughs> I thought that was funny because she's like so ridiculous. It also goes to show that race can be used in a funny joke. Like in this case, it's funny because clearly the character is saying something problematic, but it more is making a joke about how dumb she is and close-minded she is. In Shane's movie, Not Cool, the joke about Indian people was they have accents and you love it. Like that's not the same. Just making fun of the race as a whole is not funny. Making fun of someone's misunderstanding of the race in this like suburban kind of middle of nowhere white town. That's both relatable and funny because like we all kind of know what it's like to grow up in a podunk town like that where everyone's small minded. Thumbs up if you love Wicked. Tori gets so bored at this party that she leaves. If you recall in Not Cool, she gets puked on and that's why she leaves. Two different worlds. And then we come to our inciting incident. Yes. I don't know if it was on the the ground or the van. Ooh, I don't think it matters. Can you take me to the hospital? Here's the deal. I don't feel drunk, but I had like three vodka crayons in there. So you could have a concussion and I could get a DUI. Now here's some conflict that I can get behind. In Not Cool, Shane was hit by the car and he was like, ah, Tori, the Ori? And then he got driven home. It was like, was that how car accidents happen in your mind? Have you ever seen a car accident on television? So it makes a lot more sense here that Scott sustains a head injury that actually lasts throughout the remainder of the movie. People are like, you're all bruised up. And I've worked on films where I've had to maintain a character's bruised, like black eye throughout the whole movie. It's a lot of work. I worked as a makeup artist on, on sets for commercials and music videos and short films. Also, the stakes get even higher when Tori is like, okay, so I've been drinking and if you go to the police or the hospital, I'm gonna get in so much trouble. And it's really interesting because it's like, okay, now I'm seeing like characters that are not perfect. I can see why she would want to hang out with him in this case to make sure he's okay. She's like, I'll just stay awake in my car and I'll make sure you're not concussed to the point that you're passing out. And then once I sober up, I'll drive you to the hospital or whatever. Do I think it's responsible to show a teen who was drinking underage and then got in the car like immediately after three drinks and was ready to go? No, I don't love that. That. But Anna Martinucci wasn't making this movie to broadcast to her 15 year old audience, right? It was more of a coming of age movie and not a teen comedy. I think that's, there's a difference there because more young adults, I guess, would watch coming of age things where someone's little cousin named Tabitha is gonna be watching if you're marketing it to children. You know, it's not the same, not the same. Our depressed ex-girlfriend was texting Petrov being like, yo, can I buy some weed from you? And he lets her come over to talk about it. And I also really understand Petrov, this character. Like, I know these people. They were the straight guys at my high school who I was like, boo, get a personality. Like, they sold some weed and they thought that made them such a badass. And he's doing it here. He's mansplaining marijuana to her as though she's a child. So here's the deal. We're gonna smoke a little pinner in here now under my supervision because I'm actually like a little bit worried about you. If I see you can handle your shit, I'll give you another little bit to take home. 
sound like a fair deal. No, how about you just sell me the thing that I came here for originally and I don't have to hang out with you at all? I would be so turned off by this conversation. I'd be like, we're talking about marijuana here, not the drug from Limitless that lets you use 100% of your brain. Like, come on. Maybe it's just because I live in California and I'm like, eh, what are you talking about? Heather basically talks about how she's not happy at school. She's an English major. Everyone else, they went to Penn State where she is because it's a party school and they took majors in Parks and Rec because they thought it'd be easy. But I love this scene because it starts to establish a relationship between Heather and Petrov, who kind of hang out throughout this movie and help each other out because they're both like kind of depressed or you know down and it's a little ambiguous as to like what's going on with them because she just broke up with his best friend so it is a little weird that they're hanging out remember and I love these layers you know I'm like oh they're hanging out when Scott probably wouldn't approve of it it's like that's drama that's what I'm here for give me that type of nuance social constructs layers of talking and politics and things to unravel and subtext to the conversations. That's the film industry. I am not an optimist. Me neither. Scott is. See, it's like that conversation reminded me, oh, what are they doing here? What's going on here? And it sets something up that I'm hoping will have a satisfying conclusion later on. The similar plot line in Not Cool was the will they, won't they between Joel and Scott's sister, Janie. But you basically, I mean, it wasn't interesting to watch other than just Joel being funny. But I mean, I never once at that point was like, will they get together? Won't they get together? I was more like, what's going on here? At all times, what's going on here? <laughs> Meanwhile, Tori and Scott are waiting out his concussion in the car and they keep giving me more reasons to not like Scott which is a good thing in this case I don't think he's supposed to be the most redeemable character off the beginning because you want to feel that kind of progression he won't shut up about high school and I'm like dude if you talk about what you did in homeroom one more time I'm gonna push you out the window like I swear I love senior year pretty sure the entire school had a crush on you especially Todd the assistant principal. Yeah, Todd and I did some really great work together. Oh, let me see your pupils. So you see how it leads right in from a little bit about the character. Oh, he's kind of a douche who loves high school and had a first name thing with the vice principal. Like, did you have those kids in your high school who were like, well, I'm so cool with the teachers that we call each other by first name. And we had a lady at our school who was like that, like wanted to be best friends with all the cool kids. I was like, you're a grown woman playing into this popularity game. Yikes. Anyway, I love how it went right from reestablishing that he is living in his glory days of high school to them suddenly looking into each other's eyes and kissing. I felt it was believable because she seems a little annoyed by how much she brings up high school the same way I would be But at the same time you can tell she thinks he's hot and I love it also because Scott is played by a hot person in this movie Someone who is like constantly getting rewarded for his good looks constantly getting favored and privileges Because a he's popular and his family's popular and he's this hot, you know He must get whatever he wants. So I believe it when she's like, um, screw it I'm just gonna kiss him and not cool. It was so much more blatant than that it was like Tori being like, oh, please, you know you're attractive and everyone wants to sleep with you. It's like, I didn't know that. You should have showed me that. And they showed me it in this script. So show, don't tell. That's the takeaway I'm, I'm going to continue to give you. Here's, in fact, how that kiss came about in Not Cool. Oh, I was prom king. I'm cool. So that means I'm cool forever. So maybe it's time that you try something new. Try something a little bit different. Because obviously this whole... <laughs> She was like in the middle of berating him about how wrong he is for all of this. And he kisses her, so it's like, how attracted was she? I don't know. It wasn't good, suffice to say. Back in the van, which is another carryover that existed in both scripts, Tori and Scott both sleep together for the first time. And let's just say there's chemistry. Oh my God, look how much my neck is moving. Let's just say there's chemistry. And Scott is peeing outside the van in the morning and that makes the person whose house they're parked in front of very angry. Drive, 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 drive. Oh, hey, how you doing, Donnie? Now, if that scene looks familiar, Shane's version of the script makes it, I'm taking a dump on my ex-girlfriend's lawn. Shane was like, subtlety, she's not allowed in the house of extreme reactions. Uh, abort mission, abort mission! 
See? It's even less funny. Like, I didn't think that was super funny in Holidaysburg, but at least it tells me a little bit about the crazy people who live in this town. It gets them to the next place. Scott and Tori kind of say their goodbyes a little bit, and this moment is so relatable. Watching Tori do a 97 point turn is me. I guess I'll see you around. Okay, okay, sure. I live for this because my whole adolescence was me driving badly while other people that I looked up to watch. Like if I had a crush on you, you were gonna see me try to parallel park outside the high school and it's a nightmare. I really see myself in this piece, you know? That's what I'm getting at. When Scott gets home, his brother Phil is trying to perfect his dad's pumpkin pie recipe. This was the scene that the actor who was Anna Martimucci's brother-in-law got into a little scuffle. He's like, oh, well, me and my brother kind of worked on this scene, which is on the director's fiance. And it really came off like, God forbid, I override what my fiance said in his direction. So I can see why it became a little bit of a thing. Anna played it off really well. She did not let it show or get to her. And the scene came off good, but it was like, you would never know that that much tension goes into this. I was determined to use those perfectly good pumpkins. Boiled them up, added a bunch of stuff, but I just couldn't get the taste right. I called dad. You were right, Mish. Canned pumpkins? Totally where it's at for dad's pies. It's the only way to do this. Leave it to a man. How are you gonna take some leftover pumpkins from Halloween and just boil them up and make them into a pie? No one told you to do that. Another uh, kind of fascinating, not as strong point for AM when she was directing Holiday's Berg is that she would spend a lot of time shooting scenes that have very little significance. And that would leave her with like a really cramped shooting schedule for really important scenes that were loaded with dialogue. For example, check out this shot here. She shot that for like four hours, just getting him to walk in and fall down on the bed. And it was like one of their earlier shots in the movie, so maybe she just didn't have the same concept of time, but like how many different ways can he do that? How many different performances can he give of that? The next morning, Tori is like, oh man, my parents didn't even notice that I snuck in so early this morning. How was last night? It was fine. Cool. I told mom I heard you come in around midnight. Thank you. <laughs> See, I love that they took the time to include these moments of sibling bonding. The closest thing we had to that was at the Thanksgiving dinner in Not Cool, where they talked about crazy Aunt Linda or whatever. But Angela and Tori have such a sweet sister relationship in this movie that it's like, yeah, older sisters do be looking out for you. That's true. This movie, it was not without drug use and underage drinking. I think that was present in both Not Cool and Holidaysburg. I think that Holidaysburg handled teen marijuana use in a much more realistic way up until Scott smokes a joint in this because he does not look like he's ever smoked a joint before. Are you drinking a milkshake there? He's like, yes, a drug cigarette. I don't know if you're caught up with the chronology yet. I think it's easy and I'm just making it hard in my head. It's Thanksgiving day now and we join Tori at her family's dinner. If you recall in Not Cool, it was like Gil and the blind sister being all crazy, but you know, we got a much more realistic family meal in this movie. I'm thankful for forgiveness. New beginnings. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry, guys. This is between us. A group therapist told us to experiment in the bedroom. See, we still get some humor of the parents being weird, but it feels somehow in the realm of believable between what Tori's parents were giving us where they were just like, I'm a cartoon of a happy parent. It's like, why are you Bob the Builder? This was Shane's version. I, I have messed myself. Oh, okay, okay, I'm fine. Oh, a poop joke. That's funny. I really appreciate this next scene where we actually see Heather at her family dinner. Again, they're building out Heather in a way that I really appreciate. Heather was just a nobody in the in the other movie. You're gonna come home now and throw your whole life away because you miss mommy? You miss your bed? What is it? What's the problem here? Penny! 
I love restaurants, and this food straight up is restaurant quality. You can see Tori's dad is like super volatile and does not accept that she wants to leave college and really has no sympathy for her when she's clearly depressed. And I was like, wow, I just learned so much about poor Heather. She does not get the support she needs at home and she's basically being forced to continue on at school. Also, we get a little line from the stepdad there that I just thought was like a really funny way to show the difference between the stepdad and the biological dad. So I'm just letting you know, like they use dialogue not to make a funny punchline like Shane's movie would, where it's like, and who else pooped in the salad? Instead, they're actually like, oh, this can be funny and propel the character or my understanding of the character even further. Will Petroff and Heather hang out once again? And she's kind of like, oh, I hope it's okay that we're hanging out. And he's like, I know what we can do. Meanwhile, Scott is texting Tori the night after their hookup and he's like well let's hang out and she's like well I can't they won't let me leave I have to play board games and then Scott starts wilding out in a way that I have never seen if anybody ever did this to me the level of tomfoolery that he exhibits just now like he thinks he's being romantic but he's making me sick he actually grabs one of his brother's practice pies and heads right over to her house for a surprise visit it's like I don't see anyone asking you to come over here she said she doesn't want to hang out who's out there nobody will invite nobody in Bro, Pumpkin pie, hello, hey. Cheers. Scott, thank you so much for having me over. Uh, I bought you guys some pie. So what I like about it is that it actually shows the full follow through. Like he shows up at the door. She's like, what are you doing here? And then he makes his way in and starts charming the family and they start to love him. So it really worked for me because I was like, oh yeah, he's one of those charismatic teenagers who parents love and he can just show up and they're like so happy to have him. The same thing happens in Not Cool, except instead of playing charades, they're playing Dance Central. And instead of it being charismatic, charismatic <laughs> the way that Scott gets into the family it's actually repulsive so that's a slight change hey I'm Scott friend of toys <laughs> well uh, come on in Scott we're just about to play dance central you know in high school they used to call me a depressed dog why cuz I ain't got no <laughs> <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> Every time I show a clip of this movie, I get PTSD. It's like flashback to watching this movie. What kind of depressed dog has no bones? What kind of compliment about dancing is it if you say someone has no bones? That's not a thing. None of those are easy to understand jokes. And then the joke is so unfunny that he stands in front of this person's mother and does this. Who? 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 Like, the jokes are so bad that Shane Dawson was on set being like, oh, and then I'll just do this to get a reaction out of her to make sure that the joke doesn't fall flat. It does fall flat, Shane. You fall flat. Flat on your face like a ballerina with butter on her toes. I really said that. Petrov takes depressed Heather to a rich kid's indoor swimming pool where they're just smoking more, talking more. They do a lot of just like depressed teenager talking in this movie. And I gotta say, now that we're like midway through the second act, basically the halfway point of the movie, Movie, this is where it starts to fall off a little bit. I was here for the setup. I was getting the lay of the land. I understood that we were in Holidaysburg. Then it starts to feel a little boring from here on. I'll be honest. They could have maybe juiced up the second act and the third act a little bit more. That's all I'll say. Here we go. I'm thinking about coming home. Terrible idea. Thought you would understand. I do understand. But I also think it's a terrible idea to give up an education that your dad's giving you as a gift because he likes you. Yeah. Petrov says what we're all thinking here. I'm not saying that if you're getting your college paid for you that you can't drop out, but it's been three months, honey. Maybe wait till after Christmas break before you make that life-changing decision. Also, maybe see a therapist and get on some antidepressants. Then see if it's really the school that you hate so much. They talk about her sleeping 14 hours a day and not showering, and it's like, that's clinical depression. You think I wouldn't know what a depressed person looks like? I used to go to Subway for dinner every night. I know what depressed people look like, okay? So Tori finally pulls Scott aside and she's like, what's the deal with you coming to my home uninvited? You're like a villain in a Kevin Costner film. I hit you with my van and then you show up at my home. Throw me an extra pumpkin pies and you told me last night you love pumpkin pie. No, I didn't say anything about pies. Hey, what are you doing tomorrow? I was thinking about having a day and you have to come your own good. Oh yeah. So this is how they get their full Friday together. First of all, the Kevin Costner joke was funny. And I love that she's like, I never said anything about pies. Call out all men. If they lie to you, let them know you know they lied. That's the only rule. You can't stop a man from lying. That's just in their DNA. And yes, I'm aware that I'm a man. Thank you. And yes, I am a liar. You look really nice today. Basically, what another reason that I point out this scene is that Tori is basically like, why would you show up at my house? And he's like, come hang out with me tomorrow. And she's like, 
fun and it works like you get like she's put off by his brazen attitude but she's still kind of intrigued and turned on and it's, she's gonna show up meanwhile on tori's side on the not cool movie we get no consistency from her character whatsoever like she flips between being super angry and genuinely hating people to being like a soft girl who's hiding behind a rough exterior this is when like he first comes over and plays dance central with her congrats Guess I gotta go now, right? Happy Thanksgiving. She basically tells him off, and then the very next day when he happens upon her at the mall... What are you doing later? I don't know. Why? Because we're hanging out. What? Woo? What? Everybody get your compass out and draw a 180 degree angle, because that's the kind of curvature you need to be on if you're following Tori. But anyway, this does lead us into a sequence that is very similar to Not Cool's scene where they're like doing their effort list, and they go about all of Pittsburgh and do all of these crazy things. It made no sense in Shane's movie. I was like, so is the movie about them doing the list? Or was that just a five minute break in between fart jokes? Okay. Holidaysburg uses this as a chance to show off more of the most beautiful locations in Pittsburgh to make us be like, oh yeah, there is a little hometown charm to wherever we live. I think you're one of those who think life is better elsewhere. Thus, before I leave this hallowed ground, I want you to understand its splendor. I hate the way Scott talks in this movie. I don't think it's unrealistic, but it's annoying. It's it's like the exact vernacular of someone who had half a semester at college. They're like, thus, and therefore art thou, and Romeo, for art thou, singing it. You know, it's like, why don't you just stop trying to say things and grow a personality? But I like it. It works for him, because again, I know this character. I can basically, I keep seeing this guy, I won't say his name, but in high school, he was like super cool, and it was like, I don't think he's funny. I think he wears those weird wrist warmers from basketball games, even to school. So what are we celebrating him for. But hey, that's how it kind of works at high school. Like the cool people just get to be cool and you don't know why, but it's fine. I promise you, <laughs> no one cares after you graduate. And not cool, Tori's actually the one who suggests this trip and the motives I never was quite satisfied with. <laughs> Okay, what is this, some kind of bucket list? Yeah, except you don't die anymore. You're like so regimented. So what I'm gonna do is just loosen me up a little bit. You're so regimented. She says it 16 times in the, in the movie, but I never see it. And also, how does going to do a bunch of stupid things make you less regimented? Like buy a sex toy from a store. They try to do the pooping on the lawn thing. They do the watermelon thing in the grocery store. It's just a bunch of random, super bad-esque type prank. I don't buy how that makes make Scott any less regimented. It would just make me tired. It did make me tired. Also, side note, it shows them getting like pastrami or something and then making out right after. And I'm just letting everybody know I'm triggered by this. You gotta be really into the person you're with if you're gonna be eating while you make out. I'm not saying it can't be done, but one time someone kissed me directly after eating an Oreo when I was at my sister's college party. I'll never forget the texture. Petrov shows up to depressed Heather's home. I like calling her depressed Heather because it helps me remember who she is. He wakes her up and he's like, get up, you're coming to work with me. He like takes her to work and he gives her pizza. I just want to point out something that commonly happens when you're making movies. Like you set up your shot and she's laying down on the counter like this. So you set the angle for that. They're like, okay, then you get the pizza and you start eating. Naturally you would sit up. It takes a lot of time to change an angle. There's no natural way to just cut to a slightly higher angle for her sitting up. So they were like, can you just stay down there while you're eating? Like the blocking is a little unnatural because she eats a whole slice of pizza basically like <laughs> with her head on the table. Just something I noticed took me out of it for a minute. Oh wait, yeah, we have a whole montage of depressed Heather like at the pizza shop and I'm just like I've had jobs too you can't just bring new friends along with you and be like this girl's making pizza with me today like has she been safe serve certified does she know how to wash her hands properly and I get that it's like a small mom and pop place but can you put on a hairnet at least <laughs> yeah, I don't know it just felt a little hallmark movie to me like where it's like really okay you're just allowed to do whatever you want in this town Tori and what's her Tori Tori and Scory that's what they're 
name should be. Tori and Scory both go to this big abandoned warehouse, which I guess is a commonly known place in Pittsburgh. It is beautiful. It's like the scale of it, and it looks so abandoned and industrial. The sense of scale and anything like that is a great location because it's very cinematic to see two small people in this huge spacious thing. Can you see how sweaty my armpits are? So here we kind of get Scott giving his emotional baggage to Tori. He kind of opens up a little bit. And we had a similar scene with Shane Dawson in the gym during their day out. No one out there returns my high fives and it's happened like three times. No. If the worst thing you can say about UCLA is that no one returns your high fives, I'm guessing it's pretty great. You're homesick, homeboy. I used part of my student loan to pay for my plane ticket home. God, if my parents find out, they'll destroy me. I never understand when people like use their student loan money for other things. I did not ever get a hold of any of that money in a way that I could spend it. Tell me your secrets. Either way, it's like, I love this because it, again, solidifies Scott as this shallow character who you're like, come on, man, I'm rooting for you here. But you're mad because people don't return your high fives. No one wants to touch anyone's hands. Anyone hands. No, anyone hands touching these days. That's all I know. Yeah, like, and it's good because it's, I'm groaning and I'm rolling my eyes at the character and not at the ridiculous jokes in the movie. I'm actually like invested enough to be like, oh, this character's choices aren't what I would do and therefore I wanna help or I wanna watch and see what happens. It helps me understand what kind of pathetic state Scott is in because he spent his student loan to come home when nobody was expecting him, no one asked him to come home. So clearly he wasn't actually as missed as he wanted to think when he headed out to that party. He's starting in this scene to come to terms with that sense of denial. I think we've all been there. He tries to make a move on her and she's like, I don't want to sleep together again. I just know I'm a super sensitive person and I'll probably turn psychotically obsessed with you if we do it and then you go back to school in California and your parents are moving away. I love how open this character is being about why she doesn't want to sleep with him. But I also kind of here in this moment was like, that sounds like something an adult wrote. When I was a teenager, at least I wouldn't have had that sense of perspective. Every synapse was perfectly vocalized. So things cool off a little bit for them there. They get a little awkward, but they do decide to go to this party that Kate, do you remember Kate, the redhead? She just invited her, Tori and Scott. Can't wait to stop saying those two names. Tori and Scott show up to the party. All of a sudden the voiceover comes back in and I'm like, oh, oh, damn, you hit me over the head with the voiceover at the two minute mark and at the 50 minute mark. Seems like random. It's not gonna be all throughout. Okay, anyway, here's more voiceover for you. Only in your hometown can walking into a basement next to someone feel like the biggest deal ever. They're chilling at this party and Katie is acting a fool. She's like being like, oh my God, remember when you didn't get into any of the schools you wanted and so you just went to Penn State? And it's like, okay, remember when you had stupid hair and your eyeshadow was heavy? Two can play at that game, sweetie. It really comes off the whole movie like she's competitive. And me as the viewer, I'm like, why is she like have this resentment towards Tori for leaving this small town while she stayed behind? Things get real awkward when Petrov and depressed Heather show up at the party together and that's a uh, really awkward because Scott is instantly like hey since when are you driving my ex-girlfriend around and Tori's like hey girl hey girl so it's definitely a little icy but Petrov assures Scott that there's nothing going on she just needed a ride it's no big deal and on the surface he's kind of telling the truth right like they haven't kissed they haven't hooked up at all they've just had some deep conversations while getting high I like that they their relationship lives in this dubious place and you have to kind of think about what it must mean. The sun has gone down. This is Nicholas After Dark, post Meridian, baby. Kate, she gets Tori alone in a room and she finally confronts Tori on what's going on. You have been acting like a totally different person and it sucks, okay? My mom and dad were totally like, where is Tori? Why isn't Tori around? They miss you and you know my mom is sick. She had elective D surgery. And you know what? Maybe I do like Scott Karaszewski. Deal with it. Sudden gayness, that's the best kind because you never see it coming. So it turns out Katie had repressed romantic feelings for Tori this whole time and that's why she's been like, Lenny, you think you're so great just because you came home and now you're spending all your time with Scott. Also that line, and you know my mom's been really sick when she had elective knee surgery is hilarious. And it's like another classic line from this character because I just love her like disgusting perception of the world where she's super manipulative. Meanwhile, just outside that room, Scott 
Scott and Petrov, their confrontation has sort of bubbled up to a fever pitch, if you will. And we've got official sound effects happening during this fake fight. I don't even live here anyway. Why would I come back? Okay, I'm never coming back here. So f it and f you and f you. The sound effects are throughout this movie are a little cheap, if you ask me. Not that I'm the world master of sound design, but it stood out to me, even just as a casual viewer. Why did he punch like that? And it sounded like WWE. And the same thing happened when he came in and fell on his bed a little bit earlier. The sound effects were a little cartoonish for me. I love a good Foley, you know, sweeten all of those sound effects. I like when someone in a movie, when someone leans forward and you hear like the sound of the leather on their clothes going. I think that's so cool. So when it's done right, it's done right. Well, having sort of a meltdown after his meltdown, Scott's kind of like packing up his room, which his brother's been bugging him to do the whole movie. And he flashes back to a little bit after that opening scene when Heather breaks up with Scott. We go to schools on opposite coasts. We're probably never gonna see each other again. Don't say that! Unless we force it, there's no natural way our lives are gonna intersect after these five days. I would rather not spend my time reliving some sad, creepy puppet show of our greatest hits. Love this flashback. I think flashbacks can be very cool, especially when it's revealing new information that sort of helps me understand Scott's crazy behavior this whole time. Like, this breakup was basically someone telling him, listen, come to terms with the fact that life is gonna to be different forever now. So we're starting to have some emotional resolutions here. Scott talks to his brother. Hey, you know, something happened to me making these pies, Mish. I realized I want to be a dad. So then be a dad. I don't care. That guy seems like he's almost 35, so he could probably just adopt a child on his own. That one was kind of out of left field for me. Like, I was like, okay. I don't know. <laughs> Depressed Heather even has a scene with her stepdad who gave the funny line earlier. I really like this guy. This actor was really funny. His name, Brian Schof. He gives her some consolation about what some alternatives might be to college. Those are the years that I would have been in college. And I learned so much more just being out in the world, you know, and a little bit in jail. Just being out in the world, you know, and a little bit in jail. That is so genius to me. He's trying to encourage Heather to like go for her dreams, but the way she reacts, you kind of think like he's doing the opposite and she's like, I'm gonna give school a second try. Scott shows up to Tori's house and we get this kind of third act reunion, last ditch effort for forgiveness that we had in both movies. I want to say I'm really sorry about last night. I've spent the past couple of days saying goodbye to so many things and I'm not ready to say goodbye to you yet. Ah, uh, so they kissed again. And that was a little more, e I would say easier to watch than what happened in Shane's movie, if you want to watch that. I'm selfish, I'm self-absorbed, but I want to change. I'm sorry about the prom picture. <laughs> I don't know why that kills me so much. He goes, sorry about the prom picture. Mwah. My light source. All right, guys, we're in the home stretch. Stay with me. I like this little twist, this little subversion that we get from Tori. Thank you for saying that, but I'm sorry. I just don't think it's gonna work out. Queen, yes self-assured queen that we all deserve. She's basically like, everything I said about you moving to back to college and me moving back to my college and never seeing each other again is still true. It's gonna be hard to have a relationship. I'm not into it. That's the kind of love that I have in my heart. I love sensible women. I would watch the Babysitter's Club every day when I was growing up. I was like, these girls are entrepreneurial. I stand. Okay, even Scott and Heather have this kind of nauseating scene where he's like, I'm being the cute, funny one. And they are like, oh, well, you know, good Bye again. More like kind of like, I'll always remember you. My favorite, Angela and Courtney, they convince Tori to go to a party because she's sort of depressed after she tells off Scott. She's like, I can't. Are you gonna go to Phil and Scott's tonight? Jen Steinecker called and told us about it, something about pie. Who is Jen Steinecker? Why are you calling people's sister and telling them all about the parties? Does Tori not have a cell? Like we've seen her have a cell phone. So she seems adamant that she's not gonna go. Meanwhile, Scott is like high-fiving people coming in, seemingly reliving his glory days. Like finally, like he's been kind of seeking this whole time. I feel like the people in the party would be like, does this guy just get done with a basketball game? Why is he high-fiving everyone? But finally, Tori is watching the charades and it reminds her of Scott and she's like I have to go back hey, hey. Wait, no. hey. Oh, oh. Ah, ah. 
That's hilarious to me. Well, first of all, I love that they showed that little bit of hesitation with Tori. She saw him and she ran and almost turned around because it was just like too much for her. She's too scared, she's too emotional. And then they turn back and hit heads, which is just like when she hit him with the car. We're getting that kind of closure. It's, it's Those are the types of satisfying things that just seep into my subconscious when I'm watching a movie and make it feel like I'm getting an ending that I want to see. You know, Shane Dawson could never. Sorry, he didn't have any layers like this in his script. Tori and Scott basically kiss and go back to the party and sleep together once again and it's very romantic and everything a girl I suppose could want. There's a little montage of them enjoying their last hours together and they seem to just be soaking it up in this very low budget way of just sitting around the laundry room there but sure mom. Petrov drives Heather back to Penn State so it's clear she is going back to school and they seem very happy about it and then we get the voiceover to come back in and wrap things up. Just to remind you how the voiceover wrapped up Shane Dawson's movie. It had this like really thin, all of a sudden connection to social media. As soon as we comment on the present, we kind of lose it forever. And the present is where things happen. Sometimes it's difficult, but it's always the place to be. It's hard to be in the present sometimes, but it's always where it's at, man. It's not particularly inspiring. You know, it's like, I don't really believe that that message was infused into every frame, which is a little more the case with Holidaysburg. Here's how the voiceover comes in for them. John Updike, who grew up in PA, not far from Holidaysburg, wrote, each day we wake slightly altered and the person we were yesterday is dead. So why be afraid of death when death comes all the time? There's just something nice about the idea of dying every day and of being born and born and born. See, how nice is that? I'm like, oh, that's a message. It's kind of spelled out for me through this quote, but her interpretation of it definitely applies to what I just saw. And it makes me feel like I'm leaving the movie happy to go forward and like conquer life, whatever, and feel proud of myself. So it leaves me with a good emotional feeling and I think successful in that way. Plus, I just think it's amazing because you watch Not Cool and the voiceover at the end is like, well, I guess that's all you need to know, but things are cool. <laughs> and then Holidaysburg is fully like, it was the best of times. It was was the worst of time. 1000% different once and again. And I gotta say, I mean, this was probably apparent throughout my commentary, but I really enjoyed Holidaysburg so much more. It was such a more strong film, in my opinion, which is why it has, what does it have on Rotten Tomatoes? We should take a trip to Holidaysburg, Pennsylvania together, you guys. Holidaysburg has a 75% rating on Rotten Tomato. So yeah, take it as you will. Seems like a lot of people agree. The movie's not perfect. Like I said, I got a little bored towards the end. Like I was watching it on my couch and I was like, okay, we get it. Pittsburgh, cars, vans, you have a hat on, nice. So you can be prepared to maybe browse your phone a little bit in the last half. I hope that's not rude to say. I mean, it clearly is, but just take it in a nice way. I would ask you to, but I don't know. What do you guys think? And a lot of people don't agree with my last commentary either. And that's totally cool. If you liked not cool and you didn't find it offensive, love you for that. I love that journey for you. But let me know what you would think of Holidaysburg based on this commentary. You can watch it for yourself using the links below. Thank you guys so much for tuning in for another clip breakdown. I really need your advice on what movies or things I should cover next. I'm happy to go in whatever direction you point me in, so just let me know in the comments. Also, give this video a big thumbs up if you want to let me know that you care to see more uh, clip breakdowns from your favorite creators. Also, make sure if you're new to my channel, I would love to have you click that subscribe button right down here. I upload two new videos every single week, so turn on notifications if you don't want to miss a single second of them. Every single time. I've got videos like this on commentary, so check out the playlist. But we also do product reviews, lifestyle, DIY, but it's always got the Nick Dramio twist on it, baby, so click subscribe. You guys are all the greatest. Thank you for getting down and dirty in Holidaysburg with me. I will see you next time.